Guess who's back? Guess who's medicated and ready to sell out? That's right, I'm about to start my last semester of college and I'm facing the impending specter of probably not getting into grad school and having to go right into employment with a degree I got for the sake of grad school. So here I am, coming to you with all the anime hot takes you're ready to passively consume, hoping to convince you to sign up for my Patreon because I'm going to be uploading constantly and consistently from here. I was planning on coming back with a video about the writing of Yandere Simulator, but considering how it's been four months since he was just about done, I'm going to stop holding my breath. So let's talk about some awful anime! <coughs> so the first anime here that I checked out, was it any of the anime anyone was going to talk about? Nope, it was the world of Leodale. Leodale no Daichi ni for the weebs out there. This instantly caught my eye because it is a generic isekai with a female protagonist. That didn't seem full of fan service. How was it? It was boring! Woo! -hoo -hoo -hoo! For real though, it's almost surreal how little the scenes of this show flow into one another. It's not episodic, but when she goes from one thing to another, whatever is in the last scene isn't built off in the slightest. It's almost transfixingly boring. There was one interesting piece of visual storytelling, which I will talk about on my TikTok! That's right guys, I'm getting into TikTok! Links in the description. Akabi-chan's sailor uniform is a very weird show that makes me feel kind of uneasy. On the surface, it is about a cute little girl who's about to go to middle school and has big aspirations, but this has massive men writing women energy. And it's about a 12-year-old girl. She wants to become an idol, there is a joke about her having gained weight and her being ashamed of it, and she is really excited to wear a sailor uniform. And also, she meets a character at school who is a girl her age, and who gets introduced clipping her own toenails and sniffing the clipper afterwards. Uh... The show is that special kind of wholesome, pretentious nonsense. The scenes don't have tension or flow together in a meaningful way. You'll just have a scene of them buying fabric but they use a lot of cute, excited expressions, wholesome moments, and intermittent piano music to make it feel vaguely important. It's the kind of writing that has heart and literally nothing else going for it. The plot hook is that she wore a sailor uniform because they used to have those at the school, but they switched to a new uniform and now she's embarrassed and... Oh god! There is way too much sexualization of this kid. There is a scene of her in the bath and one of her changing and both go on way too long and there is way too much 12 year old feet. Dan Schneider, that you! So after that love cracking horror, I decided to treat myself to the anime adaptation of a manga I really like, My Dress Up Darling. It's a cute romance about a guy who's obsessed with making dolls, forming an admiration for this popular girl in his class who's really into anime. She was really nice to him despite him having no social skills, encouraged him to stand up for himself, and is really adamant about how it's fine to have weird hobbies. She wants to cosplay but can't sew herself, so the male lead agrees to make costumes for her. The first episode ends with what I think is just a perfect execution of a plot twist. See, this feels like a complete story. This doesn't seem to have anything that's unanswered, everything lines up, it all feels right, and you think you have a good read on this girl. And then at the end she drops that the character she wants to cosplay as is from an H game, and yes, she continues to be an absolute degenerate for the rest of the series. I can confirm that the story in general is a whole bunch of the good stuff. It doesn't have a lot of the stuff that really annoys me about a lot of romance anime, and it's just sickeningly sweet. I love it. I do want to add that I really appreciate this new Japanese feminine ideal of confident and assertive women who earnestly pursue their passions and are in full control of their sexuality. We've come a long way from that fairy tale themed rom-com where the male lead is kind of meek and the female lead is a hard ass, and they treated it as romantic when the female lead got amnesia, started acting traditionally feminine, and then had a cute moment with the male lead. I watched that over half a decade ago and I'm still mad. Next up is She Professed Herself Pupil of the Wise Man. It's about a person who gets isekai'd into an MMORPG. Original, I know. The MMO has huge factions and kingdoms and stuff, and it opens on the main character and his best friend doing this really cheesy and dramatic discussion only for them to then go into another room and be like, yo, that roleplay was awesome. I took a screenshot, wanna see? Which is 
really refreshing to see. And then you have things like the main character summoning a muse to buff his other summons, and instead of some angelic song, it just sings something from his J-pop playlist. It's great. I just kind of wish it was in a show that had even mediocre writing. You know that kind of writing where it's all, oh, hey man, remember this thing you and I did together? Aha, <laughs> good times. Oh, hey, look, it's this person. You remember this person. How's it going, this person? Remember when we did that thing? Y you know, the worst kind of exposition? That's the first half of the episode. That's the entire first half of the episode. The second half is just a really bad CG fight scene. Oh, and the gimmick of the show is that the guy gets isekai'd and turns into a girl or something. Is it even an isekai? I, I don't care enough to check. The next one on the docket is Doll's Frontline, and I didn't expect to be saying this, but hey, this was actually pretty alright. It's based on what I think is a mobile game of the same name. It's about a war fought with automatons, which are cute girls with guns. The first episode follows a team of four of them as they do some spy stuff and get into some shootouts. There's a weird amount of, like, serious themes here with the girls having to deal with the fact that they're tricking a bunch of subordinates into doing a suicide mission and... I kind of respect the hustle, if I'm being honest. Real talk, this is just decently above par action. The animation is satisfactory, there's some cool strategizing I pretty much understood, even if it was a bit silly and probably doesn't hold up to scrutiny. I can't believe I'm saying this, but this is one of the better shows I've watched this season. I have a couple friends who will disown me for saying this, but it needs to be said. Sop Mod Best Girl. I was in a good mood after that and was optimistic about this next one. The strongest sage with the weakest crest. It started off on a really good note, if I'm being honest. Some nice combat animation where someone describes there being four crests someone can be born with that determines how good they are at different types of magic, with the fourth apparently being the strongest. That was a flash forward though, and we go back to a time when the fourth is considered the weakest, but we have someone with the fourth crest who is a total badass. He helps a girl repair a sword in a really impressive way using his magic, and the two of them instantly form cute crushes on each other while their friend starts shipping them, and things are looking totally fine. Uh, this sounds interesting and like it'd be a, it could be a fun little romp. However, this story quickly turns into a special kind of plot. It's a plot where the main character is made to look super smart and interesting by making everyone else really dumb. See, he uses a form of magic, wordless magic, which is superior in every way to encanted magic, which uses incantations, ex except that it's harder to learn how to use. And he is the only person who uses wordless magic. He goes to a school where he totally aces the entrance exam, despite having the weakest crest, blowing everyone else out of the water and showing up the teachers. He's 12, by the way. He gets called to the headmaster's office, where the headmaster tells him that he needs this kid's help bringing wordless magic back into the education system. It's hard, however, because their much more successful sister school decides their curriculum, and the sister school only uses encanted magic. They show this kid the research from that school, and the kid is disgusted by it. They need the kid to prove that wordless magic is actually superior by using it at the incoming inter-school competition. Oh wait, no, no, sorry. That would actually have a little bit of restraint. No, they want this kid to teach everyone at the school wordless magic because he is the only one who knows how in addition to using it at the competition. He teaches them, goes to the competition, and then defeats a demon because apparently demons are responsible for people looking down on the fourth crest and wordless magic. He's 12, by the way. Mary Sue is a term that comes to mind here, which I think is very applicable. Just the pacing is all over the place. The world building sucks. Everything is about how the main character is the coolest 12 year old ever and there's no tension. I don't like this show. It's very bad. Also, this main couple is basically the epitome of everything romance stories like My Dress Up Darling reject, with the female lead's main character trait being feminine, and the male lead constantly impressing her, and the romantic moments not having much to do with chemistry and just consisting of the two of them doing something prototypically romantic and then blushing. Next! The War of the Rose King was definitely one of the better anime this time around. It's about the War of the Roses from English history and is loosely based on the Shakespeare plays Henry VI Part Three and Richard III. It's definitely got a classic E vibe to it with frequent skips forward in time and a lot of theming and symbolism and a lot of unintentionally gay undertones. I, I mean that all in a good way, of course. I, I don't think the storytelling is anything spectacular, but it kept its hooks in me the whole episode. It does make a lot of interesting decisions, like a flirtatious specter of Joan of Arc that appears in dream sequences and taunts the main character and making Richard intersex, but all of it kind of works. It's hard to explain, but the whole thing has a lot of confidence in what it's trying to do, and it works to the show's advantage. 
Fantasia Sango Realm of Legends is impressively bland. It has so many cool ideas in it. It's a battle shonen where exorcists need to force evil spirits out of people they've possessed and given superpowers to. The main character uses these like calligraphy powers and there's this girl who sucks up the energy of evil spirits to strengthen herself, but it causes her to sometimes lose control. Like all of that sounds great, but the whole thing kind of reads like a screenplay. Like, instead of us seeing the monster trying to break out of the magical barrier and having that communicated to us via good visual storytelling, we instead see it doing something and get told by a character that it's trying to break out. There really wasn't much work to try and make these mechanics feel good to watch. Also, I gotta say, this might be the first anime I've seen where it looks like the characters are on strings when they're flying around. Next, I watched World's End Harem. It's a story about a virus that killed all the men in the world but five. And so those five have to breed with as many women as possible to save the human race. And no, artificial insemination doesn't work. They tried and it failed. So the old-fashioned way is the only way that works. The main character, Reito, wakes up from five years of suspended animation to a world where he's expected to be a stud, but he wants to save himself for his high school sweetheart. Meanwhile, the New World Government, which is called the... The UW, or United Women need him to, well, save the human race, which isn't his priority right now, I guess. Now, all of this is a lot, and there are a lot of really easy jokes to make, which I'm not gonna do. I like to think I'm better than that here on this channel. But what I find particularly fascinating about this story is not how it shoves ass in your face, but how its writing is ass. So we start with the hook of him being shown all the women he can- Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, that's TOS. Uh, but after that, we have a flashback of the main character confessing to his childhood friend that he likes her. We know nothing about the relationship, and they don't show off any chemistry with each other. They just kind of talk about their love drama situation. It's one of those scenes that reads like a plot summary. During this, the girl uses a high-tech smartwatch that projects interactable holograms. She also mentions a cure for a disease being made by an AI. The main character then, on a train ride, gives us exposition about how this is the future and there have been many advancements in technology and medicine. The entire episode is written like this. It has the plot of a hentai. It is written like a hentai. It has the animation of a hentai. But it is not a hentai. The furthest they go is full frontal. There is no reason to watch this. Like, there is some interesting potential behind the concept of a harem protagonist who doesn't want to be one, and how the assumption that men are just DTF all the time is an unhealthy and unrealistic one, and maybe this show would be a decent exploration of it if it had any decent world building and it wasn't obvious you were supposed to want to be the main character. I want to end on a positive note, so I'm going to talk about Rust Eater Bisco, which is probably the most promising new anime I watched this season. In a post-apocalyptic Japan, we follow the life of a doctor named Neko Yanagi, who has dedicated his life to helping the poor by treating a disease called the Rust. He winds up getting involved with a terrorist who has a bow which makes giant mushrooms sprout from the ground, and it's said that those mushrooms cause the Rust. The world building here is pretty damn good, but it's the characterization that really sells it. We don't actually see much of Fisco, the terrorist, but we see a lot of Neki Yanagi, and he's so genuinely likable. He's fallible and not some Superman, but he's genuinely virtuous in a way that's really hard to write well, and they absolutely nailed it. But every other character we run into, from the governor who acts like a hammy mafioso to the old lady running the brothel who forces her workers to listen to the yarns she spins, to Neki Yanagi's little sister who's intent on stopping Fisco despite having the rust, to just these two customs agents who have this super well-characterized dynamic and that are just brimming with personality, the show manages to set up all its important concepts you need to understand in order to follow it, without any of it feeling like exposition, too, which is always really impressive. If there is anything you're gonna take away from this video, besides going to my TikTok, apparently, it's that if there's any show worth watching here, it's Rust Eater Bisco. I am going to be keeping up with this one 100%. Thank you to whoever ended up watching the whole way through. I, I put a lot of effort into these videos, not just in editing, but also trying to have genuinely original things to say. I'm currently in the process of editing a video about High Guardian Spice, where I like to think I'm making some criticism a lot of people haven't made yet. Highlights include how the show is ableist and comparing it to VTubers in order to critique its comedic structure. It's a really fun video. I think you guys are really going to like it. I'm also starting work on more videos about some of the anime I talked about in this video. A new three-episode test video for The Strongest Mage with the Weakest Crest is already getting written. Plus, I'm slowly working on what'll 
probably be at least a two-hour video essay where I do an in-depth autopsy of a bad isekai from a while back. The TikTok thing, though, for real, is something I'm actually excited about, jokes aside. Between that and Twitter, I'm gonna try and create more short-form content where I give updates on the shows I discussed here as they come out and keep track of just how bad some of them get by the end of the season. My goal for winter of 2022 is to really be engaged with all of these shows as they come out and be a new way to experience any given season of anime, because I plan on continuing to do these things. If you're at all interested in me continuing this, you want to motivate me to do it that much faster, or maybe if you just want this to be something I can do as a career one day, then consider visiting my Patreon. Once again, links are in the description. Try to leave a like, subscribe, comment down below if, you know, you want to. That stuff really helps with the algorithm, and I need all the help I can get finding exposure. I don't know how to end videos still.